All right, let's get started. So uh, welcome to the uh, CVSB 203 lecture on Kant's groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. Perhaps some of you remember me from the lecture on Descartes. I hope you enjoyed that, and I hope you will enjoy this and learn a little bit. Um, before getting to the text, I want to bring your attention to one feature of the fly sheet and one extra detail. Um, on the fly sheet, you will find there are a lot of quotations from the groundwork. This is in part to make up for the fact that I won't talk that much about the text of the groundwork itself. Today I'm going to give you more of a framework and try to give you some background on the text. Um, but when you look at those quotations on the fly sheet, you'll see that they're followed by numbers that look a little funky. Uh, uh, for instance, four and then a colon and then an, a number. And that essentially shouldn't, don't, don't get worried about that. Um, that's me because I work on Kant. That's how we cite his works. For your purposes, if you look at your groundwork book and you look only at the second number after the colon, that is the page number. And that's not the page number of your book. That's the page number in the margins of your book because that's how uh, they, they uh, match it up with the collected works of Kant. So just to let you know that. Uh, the second point is that I will not get to all of the slides. Um, I think I have 22 or more slides here. Um, they're mainly, the extra slides that I won't get to, I never get to them all, are simply for your uh, interest. If you, you will find them on the website. So if you have any difficulty finding them, ask your instructors or ask me. Um, but there's a lot of helpful things there that summarize the argument and, and other things that I, I won't get to today, okay? So to start off, uh, Immanuel Kant. I'm gonna say just a little bit about him and his intellectual biography because he is quite different from everyone you have read to this point. He is from a different tradition than say Locke or uh, uh, Descartes or others, the French tradition, the English tradition. He's in a, a very unique tradition and this will make, you'll see this as soon as you open the text, the text will read very differently. Um, it'll read very Germanly probably, uh, fitting all of the the typical stereotypes of German thinkers. Um, but here, here are some images of Kant, some famous ones. Um, down here is Kant lecturing. Uh, and as you'll notice, he's, he's a person very obsessed with detail. So one of the nice stories about him is that when he lectured, now if, if you have problems with your lecturers being boring, apparently Kant would have taken the prize for this because he would stare directly at the people he was lecturing, straight at their clothes. And, if, uh, say, a button, supposedly if a button was out of place, he would lose his train of thought and get frustrated. So he would be looking at them and inspecting them while he lectured, and this would, uh, you, can, you can just imagine what, what kind of a fellow he must have been. And you'll see this when you read the text. It's very meticulous, very detailed. And to tease out the kind of broader meaning of the text really takes a lot of time and a lot of patience. So in this lecture, I'm going to talk about a lot of those larger themes that loom behind the text, and not so much about the details. Okay, so just a little bit more before I get to his biography. I said he's from a different tradition, and you can see this already if you just wanna look at the map of the period. Um, this, if you look at the details of this map, you'll see it's very, very different from the map of Europe that we see today. Um, there is no Italy, there is no Germany. Kant lived way up in this region. You might even wonder why there were any Germanic-speaking peoples up in that region. It's now called Kaliningrad. It's now uh, no longer part of, uh, of Central Europe. Um, it's in Prussia at the, at the time, right? Um, it was, at the time, it was called Königsberg, and it was called that because this little strip of land was won in, in some northern crusades back in the years of, in the thousands. So Kant was in a very isolated part of Europe, a very uh, not, he was nowhere near what was going on in France at the time, nowhere near what was going on in, in England. He didn't read English. He read perhaps very little French. So he was in a lot of ways in his own separate tradition. Uh, nevertheless, he's a modern thinker and you'll see a lot of the common themes that you see in Locke and others. But underneath the surface of agreement with all of the other modern thinkers, you'll find a very different way of thinking about them, right? And very different concerns. Now, to get a sense of what Kant was all about, so when you, you're going to read the groundwork of the metaphysics of, metaphysics of morals, this is a text that Kant wrote at the, while well, he was in his 60s, 
right, when he wrote this work. So he had been around for quite a while and been doing a lot of thinking. And the groundwork, in fact, was a work that he proposed to write nearly 20 years earlier, but didn't get to writing because he thought there was so much preparatory work he needed to do to get to it. Um, so this is important because when you look at the groundwork for Kant himself, he thought of this as doing one really very minor task. Oh, well, it's an, an important task, but minor within the larger system. And that was to establish the fundamental principle of moral philosophy, the so-called categorical imperative. That is the goal. It doesn't explain his moral theory. It doesn't explain, uh, it gives some examples of duties and things you should do, but it does not uh, show how that moral principle leads to a whole network of duties and laws. This all comes much later in another book called The Metaphysics of Morals, as we'll see. Um, it also doesn't explain the framework of his moral philosophy. What, what kind of cosmos does he see the human being in that should follow the categorical imperative, right? What are the problems involved in thinking of a human being that can follow such a thing as a categorical imperative? Well, see, that's quite important for Kant because the moral principle presupposes freedom. And in the modern period, freedom is uh, something that looks to be more and more impossible as science takes over. So these are some of the themes. Now, looking at the text that Kant wrote, so as I said, he, he, he published the groundwork when he was in his 60s. Um, he had a long previous career. And you can see the kind of things he was interested in from say, some of the very first works he wrote. Um, in 1755, so Kant was born in 1724, and he uh, died in 1804. So 1755, very young man, he wrote a work, a very ambitious work, called The Universal Natural History of the Heavens. Right? And in this, it's an astronomical work in part, but also philosophical work. And in this book, what he attempted to do was to show that assuming the truth of Newtonian physics, all the laws of Newton, you could explain the present situation of the cosmos in every detail. Now, this may seem kind of obvious to us. If you assume all the laws of physics, shouldn't you be able to to explain the cosmos, or, or the solar system at least. But this was a major innovation and break. And the reason for this was, Newton himself didn't think that his laws could explain the present situation in the cosmos, or particularly in the solar system even. So what he noticed was, and you all know something about Newtonian physics, right? The three laws of Newton, uh, F equals MA and whatnot. Um, all of that is wonderful for explaining how bodies move once they exist and are moving in certain ways, but it doesn't explain anything about how the bodies got moving in the ways that they did originally. Right? And in particular, if you look at the solar system, we see that all the planets are in roughly the same plane around the sun. And Newton himself, in, in a couple of letters, said, my laws can't explain this, so the only explanation is divine design. So the reason all the planets aren't all over the place around the sun, hurling in different directions, and the reason they're in spheres uh, must be divine design in the beginning, right? That's, that was his argument. And Kant found this, and uh, probably a few others, found this a little bit disconcerting. Uh, and so he, he, didn't, he didn't take the tack that you might think. He wasn't uh, interested in becoming a kind of Lucretian uh, theorist, someone who just thought there were atoms and no divine being at all, and then there was just this chaos and stuff came out of it. Um, Kant thought that he could have a middle course where he could think that God created the atoms and the original things in according to Newtonian laws, simply, and that just following those laws, because God was so clever, just assuming Newtonian laws, you could get the order that's in the solar system. Now to do this, you had to, Kant had to introduce the idea of something like what we call a Big Bang. So an initial dispersion of matter, and then it's the issue of dynamism explains order. So over time, there was an evolution according to Newtonian laws, and that's how we got the planets in the same plane. This was his idea. Um, this was called the, the, the Kant-Laplace hypothesis, if you want to look it up, and it's one of the very first hypotheses of this kind to explain it. Now, in his mind, what he was doing was showing that God was not so imperfect as to have to arrange things, that he would make the laws originally so well that through the evolution of, of nature itself, the order that God could perhaps want would come out. So he was trying to, and he did throughout his entire career, try to 
back science in the firmest possible way, modern science, modern physics, mathematical physics, and yet fuse that with a view of nature as hospitable to uh, religion, to morality, to the human being. So that is almost in a nutshell Kant's entire endeavor in his life, but he does it in a very complicated way. So you can see this a little more in 1763, he published a book where not only does he contain, give this this dynamic organic cosmology, um, but he has at the basis of it a new proof of the existence of God. So a lot of you will probably, if you're philosophers or if you're uh, in other fields, you'll run into Kant all the time and you might see him characterized as being against uh, proofs of God's existence. In fact, in his critical period, he rejects all previous proofs of God's existence. But it's quite interesting that he had one himself for a very long time, right? Um, so, and what was going on there was he was trying to craft a proof of God's existence that was itself the, could be seen as the basis of such a mathematical cosmology. If you remember my Descartes lecture, um, one of the key strategies for justifying modern science was the idea of reinterpreting traditional metaphysics and religion, or metaphysics in accordance with a Christian religion. So you could get the idea that a Christian God would create a mathematical universe. That was the, the strategy, right? And Kant takes that up fully and pushes that further in, in his work before 1781. So that brings me, I won't say anything about 1770, but in 1781, the most famous work that Kant uh, wrote is The Critique of Pure Reason, and it was published again in 1787 in a revised version. Kant's 57 years old. He's published all this stuff. This is only a minor amount, what I put up there. He published all kinds of other essays, hundreds and hundreds of pages. Um, but at this point, he comes to a very different, well, in many ways, different way of looking at the matter. So he believes that his previous projects have all failed, but he still has essentially the same idea. He wants to back science as fully as possible, not only back it in the way of, of say, New, of Galileo, but in the way of Descartes, give it a foundation, show that Newtonian science is the only science possible, right? But at the same time, save room for the human being and freedom and the importance of our lives and showing that we're not just machines and these kinds of things. And he does this by what's called his critical turn. So here's the idea. The idea is the reason he thinks he can show, and the Critique of Pure Reason attempts to show, that given the structure of the mind that you and I have, the rational mind that we have, any object we would experience would have to be Newtonian and mathematical. So rather than just showing, as Descartes did, that the world is mathematical because it was created using the signs and symbols of mathematics in God's mind, Kant wants to show that the world has to be mathematical because of the structure of our minds, because it's our object, right? And that, in the Critique of Pure Reason, he goes through its you know, 800 pages of detailed attempts to prove that that is true, prove that given the logical structure of human thought and the structure of our senses, anything we would experience, if we were to experience it at all, would have to fit Newtonian physics, essentially. Right. Now, he liked this new strategy because it allowed him to say that objects are, that physical science is necessarily true of objects insofar as we look at them, insofar as we inspect them with our minds and attempt to understand them using theoretical science. Right? But our minds are just our minds. We are just rational beings. Right? All things are not rational beings. There might be some other kinds of beings. Who knows? And so when you're talking about something not insofar as it's an object of our sciences, as it may be really in itself, well, that could be quite different. And that could be the place where we believe that we are free and there is God and there is all these other things. So you can see his strategy now works on relativizing modern science to the structure and capacities of human rational minds. And he'll then find room for what he calls morality and faith in the realm of the things we do not know but may believe, right? Things not insofar as they're an object of science, but our reality. So I'm going to explain that in a, a bit more detail uh, as I go. That was the critique of pure reason, and this was the, as he called it, the big stone in his path he had to, to, uh, to, to move before he could get to the book that you are reading itself, the groundwork, 
right? And the reason he had to do that is because he had to save that space for morality, for freedom, for religion, before he could do anything else. So um, it's only in 1785, as you can see, that he publishes the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals. Title, let's say something about the title. Um, it's, a, it's a strange title, right? It's a groundwork. It's not, it's not the metaphysics of morals itself, right? That only comes later, all the way down here in 1797. And the metaphysics of morals itself gives what you might expect from a moral philosophy or a philosophy of right. So it contains uh, a deduction of property rights and laws for a state in one half, and in the other half it talks about what you have to do to be a good human being, right? Virtue, morality. And that all flows from this groundwork. So you're only reading the groundwork itself. Now, the second thing about the title of the book, Metaphysics of Morals, this is a very strange title. I, I don't, maybe some people have tried to use something like that since, but no one before Kant ever even dreamt of something quite like a metaphysics, a fundamental science of morality in this way. So what you are looking at he thinks the, the principle he's going to give you is a metaphysical principle, meaning it's entirely un, not based on empirical things. It is a fundamental science for this later science. And he thinks it's a true science. So metaphysics for him is science, period, right? So you're going to read the, 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 the book that supposedly uncovers the fundamental principle of that science, the science that is divided into the doctrine of right about state law, and the doctrine of virtue about morality. So interesting book. Uh, just a little bit afterwards, as he, he follows up on his path after giving us the, the groundwork, he then tries to show how the critique of pure reason up here uh, gives rise to pretty much all of Newtonian physics and the metaphysical foundations. He was never quite satisfied with that work for obvious reasons. It's quite an impossible thing probably to do to show that Newtonian physics flows from the mind. Um, uh, and then there's the second work here on moral philosophy, Critique of Practical Reason. And I won't say too much about that, except that it's, it's essentially Kant in this work believes he has uncovered, simply discovered the fundamental principle of morality. And in this work, he thinks he can give a full kind of justification of that principle, show that it is the one and only principle and that it's valid. And so he sees this as related to the critique of pure reason, the critique of practical reason, the critique of moral reasoning. Later, he has a work called The Critique of Judgment, um, which is not on here. So those are th Kant's three famous critiques, the first critique, the second critique, and then later one on art and aesthetics, the third critique. Uh, finally, I would say just a word about religion within the boundaries of mere reason alone. This is really important to the period because Kant's moral philosophy, although he is uh, going to d defend traditional religion in many, many ways and find a place for morality and, and human beings' values, at the same time, he's radically revising these things. Because once he has his fundamental moral principle right in the, in the groundwork, uh, the things you ought to do, which often are treated in scriptures, right, what you should do, what you should not do, uh, have to follow from that principle. And so that leads him to, in this work, look at the Christian religion in its various, all its various manifestations and to purify it, he thinks, right? So that's religion within the bounds of mere reason. Reason, that moral principle is, comes from our reasoning, our moral principle. It doesn't come from God. Um, but we'll see in this work, in the groundwork, the argument is that the moral principle belongs to us as much, for much the same reasons that, uh, Newtonian physics does, namely because it stems from the nature of our own rational minds, in this case, rational willing. That's where the principle comes from. So Kant's idea is that if God is a rational being, which most people hold, then the moral principle that holds for us will hold for God equally, right? That, that will be his idea. And so God couldn't give us duties other than the ones that we can discover through our own insight into the moral principle. And so there's a, a very controversial book he writes, um, as I said, going through the doctrines of Christianity. And you might, you might be, not be surprised he comes to a lot of conclusions like that rituals are not very important. They might be helpful, but they're not essential in these kinds of things because they don't, aside from scripture, one would not know to do those things. One wouldn't see that it's right to not work on a Sunday or, or what, what not, right? So that is uh, the general context. Give me a second here. Uh, 
Because Kant's text is so detailed and complicated and formidable, I mean, I, that I work on Kant, that's who I work on, and I'm teaching this to students is uh, uh, perhaps impossible, <laughs> right? It's impossible because I perhaps don't understand it well enough to explain it as, as, as all of you um, need to know it. So it's helpful when approaching Kant's text to have this kind of a background. In particular here, I think students like sometimes to have some unquestionable, well, you should question them maybe a little bit, but I'll say unquestionable facts. They're unquestionable because they're not very interesting, um, but facts about Kant's moral theory, things that you can pretty much be certain will hold, but of course read the text yourself and figure it out. But I'll, I'll give you those um, just to give something to fight against if you disagree with me, right? Something very clear. So here are five facts about Kantian morality. And you'll see some of them I've already covered. So for Kant, there is one moral law. This is, this is a fairly modern philosophical truth that a lot of people accept. Locke, does anyone remember what Locke said about the law? There is one law and it is reason, yeah? There, 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 there's a reason for this, the, this idea in one law. It's because there must be one foundation and usually in the modern period that's traced back somehow to reason or rationality. And reason is really the source of that law. Reason is the law. And then all the many laws we have are applications of reason in many different ways, right? So for Kant, there is only one moral law. Everything you should do and should not do is determined by one principle. That might be quite surprising. Yeah? Um, even even uh, you know, religious texts that have multiple laws, not just one law, right? That would be too simple. Um, so there's one law in all duties or applications of it. Two, this single moral law holds for all rational beings because it's a law of reason. It's a law that comes from our own reason, right? And as I said before, this means for Kant that if we think of God as a rational being, then we cannot but think of God as also being bound by the very same law. So what's the difference between um, God and us, you might say, well, this seems to, to put us in close proximity to, to a divine being. The difference is that God doesn't have any desires to go against the law. So for Kant, God automatically follows this law. And so that's how God is better and more perfect than us. We are bodily and we have constantly have desires to go against our reason. And so we are always imperfect. We're never fully wholeheartedly devoted to this principle, but the divine being doesn't even have to be wholly devoted to it. The divine being just follows it automatically if we were to believe there's a divine being. So no exceptions. And Kant really does think of this as almost like, uh, he gives, sometimes gives geometrical examples. So just as a triangle rat logically has to have 180 internal degrees, the moral principle he will adduce must belong to rational beings. If they are rational, then it follows with absolute necessity. That's why God has to be uh, subject to the same law, because it's a law of the essence of rationality itself. So three, uh, for Kant, this law is universal, and you should certainly have some, some questions about this idea. It's universal, it's unchanging, same for all cultures, all times, all places, all planets, all solar systems. <laughs> all possible rational beings, right? Just as 180 degrees is true of all Euclidean triangles, no matter where they might appear. So it is valid even if no one ever obeyed it, this moral principle he's gonna talk about. Indeed, even if no rational beings existed, because it's based upon the logical essence of what rationality is, you, you could say with certainty, if rational beings existed, then this would be the law they had to follow, right? So counterfactually. So four, now, now, of course, three, you, you teach, uh, sometimes I, I've taught groundwork to students, and then in the second week they say, so does Kant really believe that in all cultures, morality should be the same? He's not a relativist. You say, no, he's, the, he's as far from a relativist as you could possibly get, right? Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't think that some cultures might have different rules, but that's because the same moral principle will have to be applied in different kinds of circumstances. That's as much relativism as he will stomach. So four, the moral law is valid, not because it's given to us by God, this could kind of be obvious now, nor by a king, nor by nature. 
So those are a lot of previous answers to where moral principles come from, right? They come from the divine being. They come from the king who tells me what I should and should not do, right? No, this is not where a moral principle properly comes from. Um, and it also doesn't come from our nature. So this, this is a major change, an innovation over previous thinkers. Many who thought that the moral principle comes from our reason always thought of our reason as kind of the nature of the human being. Right? So it comes to us from the way we are made. Now, for Kant, that's not the case. It comes from our reason, but not because reason happens to have a certain kind of nature, but because we, as rational beings, embrace and impose this law on ourselves. So it's because it is given by us to ourselves, this law. That's why it is necessary. So we, Kant talks about the human being as being both the author of the law, it's kind of a creation of our reason, but we're also subject to that law, right? So we have to think of ourselves, when we think of ourselves as moral beings, we think of ourselves as judging ourselves, right? That's what's contained in being mo conscious morally of something. You might say, you're all aware of conscience, you know, you do bad things, and then something in the back of your head says you shouldn't be doing that. And for Kant, that's not some spooky voice, that's you, your rational self condemning yourself that has violated rules. So you, there's a double, the moral morality is explained by a kind of double standpoint the human being takes on itself insofar as it's rational and insofar as it's not rational. And the conflict between the two is present in this kind of conscience and guilt and these kinds of things. So important thing there, that voice is not the voice of a divine being or of a king or something your parents taught you. They may have taught you and that may have helped you get there, but eventually it's yourself. Um, five, the law tells us that act what actions to perform and to omit, but morality only is about seeking to become holy. And this is the word Kant uses, holy, and it shouldn't, uh, don't get confused. He doesn't mean anything like religious holiness. Um, he, what he's, why he uses the term holy is because he thinks of it as a kind of purity, a purity in our following of the law. So as I said, we as human beings always have desires to go against the law. We don't want to tell the truth. We don't want to uh, give back deposits people give us of money if they die in the meantime and no one else knows about them. We want to keep that money. Um, we always have those desires. And so morality is not, for Kant, so much about deciding what you should do and what you shouldn't do. He wouldn't be interested in an applied ethics class you know, where you debate whether abortion is allowed or not. He thinks this principle will show you pretty easily, and every human being implicitly knows that whether it's right or not. The real task of morality is about following that law with purity. That's what the project of a human life is about, is about purifying ourselves. And that's why he calls it becoming holy, changing one's heart so they don't do good things grudgingly, right, if they do them at all. So, at, the, at the, the center of this is the idea that ultimately we should obey the law, the moral law, the moral principle, simply out of respect for it. We should do it because, we should do the things it tells us to do because it commands us to do them, simply. So this is an internal matter having to do with a good or virtuous character. In other words, doing right for the right reasons and not for the wrong reasons. So those are the five facts. Um, I'd like to hear if any of the instructors or anyone else comes up with uh, other facts or any reason that they think that I should change some of these facts uh, in the future. So what is this looming large and everything I've said is this idea of a moral principle. What is this moral principle, the one moral principle? Um, just as you might expect, Kant, well, I, I would, Kant insists there's one moral principle, and he just as soon gives us a whole bunch of different formulations of it, right? There is one, but there are four, and the four are really one, and you'll see this stuff in the text. Um, it's not because he's confused so much as that he's very, uh, uh, he, he has ideas about, that make things very complicated. So here, here is what, in essence, the moral law is. And I'll just read these different formulations. Uh, Alan Wood, a Kant scholar, kind of gave them names, which is why I've put them here as those names. You'll see, see that in the literature if you read Kant's moral theory. So the formula, the first formula of this law is the formula of universal law. It says, quote, I ought never to act except in a way that I could also will that my maxim should become a universal law, right? He also puts the same, he says the same thing, act only in accordance with that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. 
Now, what does this mean? We have to break it down. I ought never to act, so this is a duty. It formulates a duty. I ought never to act, except, okay, uh, in a way that I could also will, now this is not desiring or wanting, I could will it to be the case, right, rationally, that my maxim, now what's a maxim? Anyone have an idea what a maxim is? You've heard of maxims? Maxim for Kant, you can, in fact, if I asked a Kant scholar that, they would, their head would explode because there's so much written on maxims and no one knows quite what they are for Kant. But the basic idea of a maxim that you can always work with is it's a, a statement that expresses my, the rule I am following when I act. So essentially all this is saying I ought never to act except in such a way that the kind of rule that in my mind I'm following, my maxim, right, I could also will that that rule should become a universal law. Well, that's, that's kind of obvious, right? What that would mean then. So if I say I want to lie, can I rule that lying should be a universal law that everyone follows necessarily? Could I do that? And I ought never to act unless the rule I'm following, in this case, lying because I feel like it, could be universalized. And I could not just be universalized, importantly, but I could will it to be universalized. That's a key element, right? Maybe you could universalize murder, and everybody would just kill each other, right? But can I will to murder, and at the same time will that that law be a universal law that everyone murders? Is that consistent? Could I do that? So that's the question, that's the formulation of universal law. I hope you see the difference between that, being able to it be the case that it's universal, or being able to will that it's universal are two quite different things. So second, the formula of the law of nature. So this one says, act as if the maximum of your action were to become by your will. So again, the, but I'm, my willing would make it such that the maxim, the law, I, the rule I describe, would become a law of nature. And of course, here he's thinking of laws of nature like uh, Newton's laws or whatever, followed automatically, uh, mechanically by other human beings. So you see it's quite, kind of similar to the first law, except here he's using the image of natural law in terms of physical law as a kind of tool for understanding what does it mean for it to uh, apply universally, right? Um, this one gets a little more interesting, the formula of humanity as an end in itself. So you see, it says, so act that you use humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always at the same time as an end and never merely as a means. Now that looks to be very, very different from the formula of universal law, right? The, not, the formula of universal law says nothing about human beings as ends. It says nothing about humanity. It says nothing about means, right? Uh, so first of all, let's see what this, what this formula means. I think you'll, you'll grasp it pretty quickly. So ask, act so that you use humanity. So you're using humanity somehow. Uh, whether in your own person or that of another. So this even is the basis of duties to oneself. You can have duties to yourself, to improve yourself, not to uh, abuse yourself, not to kill yourself, these kinds of duties, but towards others, such that you always treat that humanity as an end. Now an end, an end is something that is the reason why you do other things, right? The end is the ultimate goal of what you do. So if you treat something as an end, you do other things for it, right? You don't do it for other things. That's called a means, right? If I use humanity as a means, then say I want to get my, my car washed and so I force another human being to do it. My end is getting my car washed. What am I using to do it? The human being, right? And I am subjecting them, their humanity, to the end that I have. I'm using them as a means. So that. When Kant says you never, you should never, you should always treat other human beings as ends, but never as means, um, he's saying, well, never, not at the same time. So um, I should never treat a human being such that they are a mere means. I should always be treating them as an end, meaning the things that I do should always be for other human beings in a certain sense, right? Now you might ask, does this, immediately to your mind say, so I can't have anyone wash my car, I must wash the car myself, but I can't even wash the car myself because I'm not allowed to use myself as an end, as he says, right? Um, but notice at the same time. So you can use someone else to wash your car, you just can't do that without treating them as an end at the same time. So you enter into a kind of contract with them. You treat them as an end by, a, uh, by respecting their humanity. So you say, I will give you a certain amount of money, 
and you don't have to take it if you don't want, right? You can give it back if you don't want to do it. You have the choice. You are an end in the sense that uh, what you do is determined by your own interests, right? So I can use you as a means, but only if I also respect you as an end at the same time. So how does this rel relate to the others? Now, I won't go into this detail. We should, because Kant says there's one principle, and these, this principle looks very different from the others. Um, but there's a lot of, of complications there, a lot of discussion of this issue. You might say, the, it, it kind of makes sense, though. So think of the case of lying. If I were to lie to someone, could I lie that, could I will that everyone lies while I lie? Well, I couldn't because my lying, for instance, when I lie, I am expecting other people to believe me, right? And so, and I'm expecting other people not to be lying to me in turn. If everyone lied, then my lie would not work. So I can't at the same time will to lie and will that others lie always, right? So there's some inconsistency there, therefore it's not right. Another way to look, look at that is say, when I lie, I want other people to be treated as a means, right? I don't want, I don't want to treat them and respect their humanity. I want them to be tricked, right? I want to use, when I lie, I want to use other people for things. And so you can see there's some maybe equivalence there between the idea of, not, of being able to will something universally and treating others as ends, right? It's the best I can do in this situation. So the, uh, the, the next formula is quite important, the formula of autonomy. It reads, choose only in such a way that the maxims of your choice are also included as universal law in the same volition. Volition is just another way of saying willing, right? So choose, make your choices in such a way that the maxim I follow, the rule that I follow, right, is included as universal law in the same volition. So what Kant is saying here is think of yourself, and this is, you might see how he, he, he's thinking this is equivalent to some of the others, particularly the first one, that what I'm really doing is thinking of everything I do as if I were giving universal laws, right? So what's special about there different from the formula of universal law, is that it has included the idea always that I'm giving law in this. I'm, I'm legislating this law. That's why it's called the law of autonomy, because autonomy means self-rule. And so when I give the law both to my, when I will, I should treat myself as giving laws both to myself and to others, right? Because the moral law is about myself and towards myself as well as towards others. So that is the law of autonomy, and Kant is very, this is central to Kant, and central to Kant's place, how we understand Kant in modernity, right? Because much of what you've been seeing in the modern period has moved more and more towards the idea that the human being is the locus of its own ruling, right? Its own laws, its reason somehow, it's not kings, it's not gods, it's not these things. It's somehow human beings themselves that have to gain self-rule. And Kant really brings this, he's one of the first to bring this kind of fully to the fore and, and call his moral law a law of autonomy. And he thinks he's the first person to ever formulate it properly, such that everyone else who has ever given a moral principle, their moral principle wasn't truly autonomous. In some way it relied upon external, things external to the human being, even if it claimed otherwise. So even Locke's reason, if you go back and Locke says it's reason, it seems like it's our reason, so we're self-ruling. But Locke says, why does reason, why is reason the thing to follow? Because God gave us reason. So he gets this divine guarantee, right? In addition, which Kant doesn't accept. So finally, the formula of, of a kingdom of ends, and I'll just read it because it's, it's nice, and it brings, supposedly it brings together all of these ideas into one great image, which is act according to maxims, uh, in accordance with the maxims of a member giving universal laws, so autonomy, right, for a purely possible kingdom of ends. So it combines the notion of uh, treating other human beings as ends and myself as a legislator, seeing myself as belonging to a community of what he calls this kingdom of ends, right? Of all people obeying, uh, observing each other's humanity. So that's the final formulation. Um, let me check the time here. So I'm going to, to because I, I anticipate in a different way much of my, my, my further slides, I'm going to skip to um, Kant's attempt let me find it here. 
Okay. How does, so, so we said Kant wants to uh, establish this fundamental principle, all these principles that are supposedly one principle, right? And the question is, how does he do this, right, in the groundwork itself? Well, the groundwork claims, Kant claims that the groundwork is divided into two parts, two, two kind of, well, it's in three parts, but two parts fit together in that their entire purpose is to analyze common moral experience to arrive at what the principle is that we follow when we do things that are right. So Kant has, uh, being a modern thinker and a thinker who believes not in kind of external authorities, he wants to find the moral principle in common human reasoning, right? If it's the law of your rationality that you are all rational, so you should all have that principle available to you. Kant thinks we all do. When we follow conscience, and when we know, think about, well, we're guilty that I did this or that, or that we shouldn't lie, we are all really just consulting our own reason. So he doesn't see himself, and he sees many philosophers as mistakenly trying to do this, to find a new moral principle, right? Utilitarianism or something, to come up with a new scheme to improve human life. Descartes had this kind of idea too. Right? And that presupposes that what we ought to do is not available to everyone, but we would have to develop it through a science or something. Kant doesn't accept this at all. He thinks that's one of the fundamental mistakes of previous moral theory. The moral principle you should follow is in your heart. He means in your head, of course, but he says in your heart. And it's this moral principle. So that's where he wants you to seek it out. In the groundwork, he starts, therefore, with that in mind. He says, the first parts, I'm going to, in the first parts, I'm going to start with common human morality. All right? I'm going to just talk to you about what you think is right and wrong. And I'm going to try to analyze it, to clarify it with you. All right? And so when you're reading the first parts of the groundwork, disagree with Kant if you disagree with him. Of course, he thinks that some of these points haven't been analyzed as fully and as clearly as he's going to do, so you might have initial disagreements. But he thinks if you think them through and you think about your own morality and follow him, you will come to an agreement about certain of its key features. And from those key features, he will be able to show you that the one principle you've been following all along has been this moral principle, and that you're always consulting it. And what he has done for you he thinks, is something not unimportant, but also not, he doesn't want to overestimate its importance. What he's doing is simply clarifying in your mind, helping you to reflect on what you already thought was right and wrong, right? Make it clear to you. So that's the first, in fact, the first two parts of the groundwork uh, are just supposed to be doing that, as complicated as they may seem. The second part of the groundwork then moves into trying to talk about the justification of such a principle. How can that be the principle of beings like us? Right? So that's what the second part is concerned with. Now I'm going to talk about just that first part. Because what Kant will do there is look at common morality with you, draw out some of its features, and then bring those together in this passage, which is here, Kant's, say, Kant's key insight. right? Once he brings together these features, you will read this, these lines here, and you will see that it follows from what you've already admitted, that the moral principle is the only possible principle, right? or is the principle you've been following always. Now, let me read it, and then we'll talk about what, his, what this means. So this is the, it's not so much a deduction or a proof as kind of a demonstration that what he has said before uh, leads to this principle. So here's what he says. This is, this is his key insight, right? the derivation of the principle of morality. Quote, since I have derived the, print, the will of every, the, deprived, excuse me, since I've deprived the will of every impulse that could arise from it from obeying any particular law, nothing is left but the conformity of actions with universal law, which alone is to serve the will as its principle. That is, I ought never to act except in such a way that I could also will that my maximum should become a universal law. So you see, we lead right into the moral principle. And this is the reason, this is the key reason, he says. Because in his discussion of common morality, he will convince you that any particular law or impulse that might motivate you to do what is right is not acceptable Therefore, no, since no particular reason can be given, the only possible reason there can be for following a law is that it fits, has the form of universality, 
right? That's the idea. Now, what does that mean? That sounds quite complicated. And how does that fit with what you think about morality? Well, let's think of a case. Let's go to the lying case, right? I should not lie. And he, as, he, as Kant analyzes that, he thinks what is essential when you think you ought not to lie is, is a very basic thing. It's that, so let's give an example. You, you, don't, you don't lie to me for some reason. Um, and I say, so why didn't you lie to me? And my question here in my mind is, are you a good person, right? So in this case, is this evidence of your being a good person? You didn't lie to me. And I say, well, why didn't you lie? And you say, well, I, I didn't lie because um, I would, you know, I knew you already knew the truth, yeah? And I would get caught and get punished, right? And I would get punished even worse for lying. You know, my, probably my sons do this sometimes. They know I already know, so they tell me the truth. Um, and now, would you say that the person who followed that law, that rule, don't lie because you might get caught in this case, are they doing something good? You tend not to think so, right? And if that thinking is very developed, you might think that's quite evidence of quite an evil character, right? That if they're always scheming and trying to act, do the right-looking things for all the wrong reasons, then that's not evidence of a good character, right? Um, what if I were to then, you know, ask this person, did, and, you know, okay, put that aside. Um, are there any other reasons? Or maybe that's not the main reason. You give me a different reason why you didn't lie. And you say, it's because my parents told me to. They told me never to lie. That's why I do it, right? And so I say to you, would you, well, first of all, you tell me, do, would that make that person what they did good? They didn't lie because their parents told them not to. Any answers? You don't know what to say? Uh, well, your intu intuitions, Kant thinks, would be like this. Um, well, the fact that you did something that is good, not lying, is completely unrelated to the principle on which you, you followed, because your parents could have taught you to lie all the time. If your rule is, do whatever your parents say, and in this case, you didn't lie because your parents said never to lie, that's not evidence of a good character or of a good, valuable action. Right? It may have good consequences, but the action itself was really based on the rule, do whatever my parents told me to do, and if they told me to lie, murder, cheat, whatever, right, um, then I would have done that. So there is no intrinsic value to that kind of an action. And now Kant goes through these and says, what is going on in all of these cases? When I give, you give me, you did a good thing, supposedly, you did something that I think is good, and I ask you, what are you doing that has undermined my belief that you're doing something good? You're giving me some external reason. You should be saying, I did not lie to you because lying is wrong, right? And I say, well, why is lying wrong? And you should say, it's wrong. I know it's wrong. It's wrong, period, right? It's wrong for no purpose other than the intrinsic badness of lying, right? So this is what Kant calls something like a categorical imperative, complicated word for a simple thing, right? It's, it's not, you're not, when you do good things, you should do them because they're good, not for any other purpose, not any other external reason. Because then those, although the action may end up being fortuitous or beneficial, the principle that you followed is not valuable intrinsically, right? So what does that mean then? Well, if I'm not to do anything because of any particular external thing, even my own personal, it's not, I can't say, it wouldn't work to say I, I told the truth because I felt like telling the truth. That's an fa internal fact, it's an external fact, but still external in a way to the, my reasons, right? I could have felt differently, right? So the, the answer there, he thinks, is that the only case is where you don't do it for any external reasons, then the only reason you can do it is from intrinsic reasons, which means the form of the rule itself. And so that's his, his, his derivation there that I just read. If I deprive all the, the moral principle of all external reasons, then the only reason left is that it's suitable to be universal law, not particular law. And that's the derivation of the moral principle. Um, okay, thank you.